doing? Does that show up now? Okay. Yes. Cool. Oh, and uh, seeing that AARP logo up there, thank you, uh, AARP folks, for uh, joining in today. Pleasure to have you here. See if I can get this to bump forward. There we go. So do you recognize this guy? That's Tim Buckley and he's the CEO of Vanguard. And the question is, what keeps him up at night? Uh, two months before he became the CEO of Vanguard, he was attending the evidence-based investing conference. And he was asked this question, what keeps you up at night? And I'll read you his reply. Cyber, it is front of mind all the time. It's a huge investment for us. You have to make sure you have defense in depth, making sure you have a strong perimeter. And I'm already stressing myself out just talking about it. <laughs> well, I, I believe him. I, I think Buckley's... Uh, Right on, on two points. One is that uh, it's a stressor, particularly for a target like Vanguard. And I also do believe that he's doing his best for those of us uh, who have some money stashed in Vanguard. So he's doing his best to protect our digital assets, but most of it is up to us. So that's why we're here today is to learn about the part that we can do ourselves. So why do the bad guys hack our computers and phones? You often heard the expression, follow the money. And that's just what uh, Willie Sutton recognized a uh, long time ago. Computer hacking is, at one time, it was sort of for fun and recognition, <clears throat> but the landscape has really changed over the years. It's not about those things anymore. It is run primarily by criminal gangs that are there strictly for the money. And they're there to steal your credit cards, your bank information, your passwords. Uh, they're there for extortion via ransomware or threats to reveal your information. For example, the fake threat to expose you, uh, expose that you watch porn, for example, uh, or to use your computer in a botnet or for something like currency mining or for a spam or attacks on other people. So that's what the criminals are actually that's what they're trying to accomplish by use of our digital assets. <clears throat> now, if you're a high profile target, like a government entity or a politician or a corporation like Vanguard, your security has to be almost perfect because the bad guys are very creative and they only have to find one way in. The good guys have to block all ways in. On the other hand, as individuals, our security only needs to be pretty good. Well, why is that? Because the bad guys are going for the easiest targets. The people whose security is maybe average or below. They're picking off the low hanging fruit. So you don't want to be the low hanging fruit. So let's talk about three kinds of attacks and the prevention of those attacks. <clears throat> Phishing is about a third of all the attacks that we have and a great many uh, compromises of systems, 
comes, starts with fishing. Second thing is software vulnerabilities. You know, things if you're a Windows user, there's uh, constant updates to software. Um, or if you're not a Windows user, software, you get prompts and you really need to respond to those prompts and get your soft, keep your software up to date. And about another third is passwords. It's something we all love to hate, uh, but for better or worse, we're, we're stuck with those uh, passwords for a while. But the point here is that if you can deal with these three things, you've got 90% of your risk covered. That's generally enough to keep you from being the low hanging fruit. So let's talk about the first of those, which is phishing. And as I mentioned earlier, most cyber attacks begin with phishing. Now most of us are not subject to the kind of attacks that high profile people are. They're just random attacks that are fortunately easy to recognize. And we're going to go through some ways that we can recognize those. Do any of these attacks sound familiar? Uh, you, you just won the lottery. Uh, of course, you didn't enter that lottery, but, but you won it anyway. Or you've gotten an email from a friend in a foreign country who needs cash because they've lost their wallet or they've been mugged and they'd like you to wire them some money. Or there's a new one, uh, a phone call offering to put you on the list for the coronavirus vaccine. Or the old one about, hello, we're from Microsoft and your computer has a virus and we're gonna fix it for you. Well, all of those are attempts to get you to part with either information or to get you to click on a poisoned website, download a poisoned attachment, or give access to your computer. The, all of those you've probably seen along the way. But all together, lumped together, these are phishing. And let's take a look at an example of a phishing email. Nope, went one too far. Here we go. So there's a few things that uh, here to, to look at, but this says that my Facebook password has been hacked. And it's from it's from my Facebook support team. It's, it's got their phone number and it's got their logo. Uh, looks pretty legit. It just says that to reinstate my account, I need to either complete the form or click the link. So what do you think? Is that a good idea? Are there some clues that uh, make it seem like less than a good idea? Well, let's look closer. Looking up at the top there, you can see that it says it's from Facebook support, but that is not a Facebook email. And this is the first good clue. If the email address doesn't look right, it doesn't pass the sniff test, uh, delete that one. Email addresses can easily be spoofed. So anybody can put Facebook support on their email address. So be sure you look at the email address too, and not just that it's Facebook support. On that link, uh, I put the mouse pointer over it to reveal where that link would take me to if I clicked it. And that destination shows up down at the very bottom of the screen. And you can see that that too is a destination that is definitely not Facebook. It's not gonna get me there. So before you click that link, hover your mouse over the link, 
check and see what's at the bottom of the screen and ensure that it's a reasonable place to go. Now they also included an attachment. Facebook.zip sounds like it might be related to Facebook, but zip is one of the kinds of files that's that may be executable. It's not something, a zip file is not something ordinarily would be a form or something that a Facebook support group would send out. So uh, particularly watch for those uh, the file extension like zip or exe or rar or things like that. Uh, those are all good little clues. Now, what if the link that's at the bottom of the screen was pointing to a URL shortener like bit.ly.abcd? Well, that's a that link shortener is sort of an intermediate step that eventually takes you to a different website. And you simply can't tell by looking at that where it's going to take you. But there is a website, <clears throat> which is on the bottom left of my slide, that's called checkshorturl.com. And if you have a fun, funny feeling about this email, go over to checkshorturl.com and just type that thing in and find out where it really goes. Could save your bacon. So let's take a short uh, break here and uh, ask questions. I'd encourage you to put your questions into the chat box and uh, Kevin will pull them out of there and pose those to me and I'll do my best to answer them. So Alan, uh, the first question that we have um, relates to using mobile devices to check for phishing. So the question is, when I use a computer, my email app shows the sender's real email address and I can hover over a link to see where it will take me, but my phone doesn't have this capability. So how can I identify phishing emails from my phone? Yeah, the, the net of that one is you can't. So the screen real estate on a phone kind of limits you this way. So you are a little more exposed if you open that email on your phone. So in that case, if you have a computer, I would go over to the computer and look at that email there first, because you can get more information on that bigger screen than you can directly off your phone. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so another question coming in is, if any email address can be spoofed, same sender address, for example, how can we tell the difference between legitimate emails from bad ones? You can usually rely on the uh, the email address itself. I, I misspoke when I said that the that anything could be spoofed. I really meant the the name at the front. It is possible, and, and I'm sure each of you has experienced this, where you get an email from a friend of yours because their account has been taken over. Um, that would be the one where they're. Uh, I, I'm in London and. Uh, please send me $100 because uh, I've lost my wallet. Well, that's a situation where the person has lost control of their email account and the bad guys now have access to it. Um, but generally speaking, you should be able to trust the, the email address itself. Just don't trust the name that goes in front of it like Facebook support because the names don't uh, can be just about anything. Okay. Um, I'll take uh, I'll take one additional question. I 
think one of the ones that came in is something that you'll address later in the presentation. So I'm going to jump forward just a little bit to ask, um, how do you feel about the safety of websites like Mint, which connects all of your banking and investment accounts into one site? Oh, good question. So who do you trust on the web? Um, if, you, if you trust Mint, that Mint has good security, if you trust that Vanguard has good security, um, then proceed. Um, inherently, there is a risk whenever you put your information into a website. And the more information that you put in, if you put in half a dozen pieces of information into, let's say, Mint, if they get hacked, then you are more exposed than you would be at a site where you put in a single bit of information. It's a tough question to answer because we can't tell how good Mint's security is or Vanguard's or anybody else's out there on the web. Um, so we have to just put our trust into the right uh, people. How do we determine that? Sorry, I don't have an answer for you. But do know that the more different kinds of information you put into one basket, uh, that if that one basket is hacked, you, more of your information goes out. Thank you, Alan. Do you have time for one additional question or do you want to? Sure. Okay. Sure. Um, Bring it on. Let's see. Uh, da, da, da. This one's from uh, Scott S. My Microsoft has been hacked. Can my iPhone be hacked? Yes, it can. Um, there is no technological. Uh, limit on that one. Um, Microsoft environments are more subject to hacking than Apple environments. But if you um, if you're if you fall for a phishing scam, you can do that the same on an iPhone or on a, a Windows computer. So. The software on your iPhone is relatively more secure than Windows, but don't, don't bet your life on it. Uh, just follow good protocols and uh, internet hygiene, regardless of what device you're on. Uh, last question that we have in this batch, we do have some comments and some discussion going on in the chat, but um, and I, you may be discussing this later in your presentation, but what is your opinion of LastPass or any other programs like, and I think specifically uh, password managers? I think they're great, uh, unequivocally, and I'm going to talk about those uh, a little later in the presentation. So uh, any other questions? It looks like we have some discussion going, but I believe those are the primary questions we have. As a reminder to the audience, if you have questions for Alan, please put them in the chat. And when we have a break in the presentation, I'll ask the question to Alan. OK, thank you, Kat. Appreciate it. Let's move ahead to the next section. And we'll talk about uh, updating your software. Those of you who are familiar with real estate know that there are three important things about real estate. Location, location, and location. Well, I was in the software world for most of my career. 
And there's an analogous thing going on there. Now, three important things during in software development are the schedule, the schedule, and the schedule. Sometimes a tight schedule leads to being a little sloppy in the code writing. And those mistakes lead to security vulnerabilities. And those of you who have uh, Windows computers are familiar with the flood of updates that comes in. Uh, the, I think it's the second Tuesday of each month. That's what they call Patch Tuesday. And those are primarily things being fixed. They're code flaws that somehow slipped out or slipped into the code got shipped out to you, and now they're being fixed. That uh, Patch Tuesday leads to an interesting follow-on, which is the criminals exploit Wednesday. What's that about? Well, once it is revealed that there's a particular problem with software and this is not only I, i'm picking on microsoft but it's true of every bit of software that's running on your phone your computer and uh, your doorbell as soon as it's discovered that there is a flaw the bad guys are going to start looking for people who haven't patched the flaw. Now, hopefully, the discoverer of that flaw, that vulnerability, has followed good practice, contacted the vendor, given them the necessary notice. The vendor has scrupulously followed up on it, created a patch, and released it so that you can install it on your computer. Well, that's, that's their part of it. But the next part is all up to you. You've got to install that new software patch onto your computer. And yeah, it's kind of a pain to go through installing all that stuff on a patch Tuesday or whenever the patch appears for your particular piece of software. But just be aware that there, as soon as that patch becomes available, there's now a race going on between you and the bad guys. They know now that this is a vulnerable piece of software. And everybody who has not patched it yet is subject to being attacked. So I would encourage you to install those patches as they come through, um, as you're prompted for them. Um, and there's there's a a corollary to this is, well, what if the patch is broken and it breaks my computer? Well, that is entirely possible. Generally speaking, the patches today are pretty good quality, better than they used to be. Every once in a while, there is something that goes wrong and you'll have to back out the patch. Um, and that's why, in, at least in the case of Windows, when you update it, it uh, automatically takes a checkpoint before applying the patch. That way you can back it out if it's necessary. But I think you overall the risk is higher if you wait. I would go ahead and apply that patch now, keep the bad guys out of the computer, and uh, it's been, gosh, I can't think of the last time I've had to back out a patch because it was 
a bad one, maybe 10 years or something. So that's pretty good odds. I, I'd go for installing the patch in a timely mechanism, a timely manner. But now what if there's no update mechanism? What if there's no prompt that tells you it's time to add a new patch to your software? Well, this is a this is a little tougher because there are a lot of things in your in your house, for example, your not only your computer and your phone, but your your router and your smart speaker and your smart doorbell and your smart door lock and your security camera and your thermostat and your car. All of these things have computers running in them. They're all running software and they all have vulnerabilities that get discovered and need to be updated. So when you have, some of these will prompt you and tell you that, yeah, here's, here comes a new patch, go ahead and install it. Well, what if it isn't telling you that? You're kind of on your own. Uh, for example, there's a, uh, a program called WinRAR, which has been around for 15 or 20 years. It provided no mechanism for update. The only way you would know that WinRAR needed to be updated is if you heard about it through the grapevine or you went to their website and found it, that there was a patch that needed to be applied, but there was just no inherent mechanism in it. What's happened in that case is that the bad guys have discovered a big flaw. There, there was a big flaw which was patched. And of course, the race began with the bad guys. In this one, it's a little more obscure to patch it. And so now those bad guys are exploiting people who might have WinRAR on their computer. And since this was uh, discovered maybe six months ago, I've probably received a dozen phishing emails that had a, an attachment that was something like Facebook.RAR. And that's the specific vulnerability that they're looking for is, uh, is WinRAR. So, the, so what do you do about that? Well, the first thing is don't install software that doesn't have some automatic update mechanism. Uh, it's it's going to, sooner or later, it's going to bite you. And WinRAR is sort of the poster child uh, for that. Um, what about all these other devices and why should, why is it important for them to be updated? Why do you need to update your router or your smart speaker? Well, because they are now on your network along with your computer and your phone and the other information that you care about. These are now trusted devices that are inside your firewall. And if the bad guys get a beachhead, on your uh, security camera, then it's pretty easy for them to move laterally to all the other devices that you own inside your network. So that's why I'm encouraging you to take a look at those. And for these ones that are non-computer phone things, they all have different ways of being updated. So you just gotta go look for it. Maybe. Say your router, um, just go, go look on the website for that particular brand and model of router and find out if there is an update available for it. Uh, if there is, apply that one. That'll help keep you safe. Uh, the one exception to this one I would uh, I'll, I'll say is Adobe Flash. There are uh, a lot of um, bogus Adobe Flash um, versions out there. 
And if you get a, a prompt to update Adobe Flash, the, the better response instead of updating it would be just get rid of Adobe Flash. You really don't need it anymore. It's, it's a very old and buggy program. Uh, it used to be like the number one source of uh, vulnerabilities. Um, Apple abandoned use of Adobe Flash years ago. If you're still using Adobe Flash, just get rid of it. Uninstall it. Kiss it goodbye. So let's see. A corollary to this one is about ransomware. Because once the bad guys can get into your computer, they may do something. Uh, it's called ransomware, where the they essentially zip up all your files, encrypt your files, and then leave you a little message that says, Sorry, buddy, we've just stolen all your files. If you give us 10 Bitcoin or whatever, we'll give you the key and you can have your information back again. Um, nowadays, the guys have gotten smarter, the bad guys have gotten smarter about who to target. And they're mostly targeting companies and organizations and government entities that are that have deep pockets more so than individuals that they used to go after but i'll tell you a cautionary tale uh from a, a friend of mine who belonged to a camera club and this, this camera club kept their photos on a computer at a church and they got infected this computer got infected with ransomware and the guy demanded some number of Bitcoin to have it uh, restored. And this was just a little camera club on a little computer and they couldn't, they weren't about to pay the ransom. So they basically lost the contents of that computer, which is unfortunate, but it could have been saved if they'd had a proper backup. And here's where, uh, the two things come together. If you if you're not quite if you miss something and the bad guys get in and lock up your files with ransomware, you can restore from a backup. It's just a point in time earlier before they were in there. You roll back to that backup and bingo, you're back and up and running again in short order. But how do you do this backup? Well, first, you make sure you back up the whole computer. That means not just your pictures and your documents, but it means you back up the operating system and everything that you need to do a bare metal recovery, because that's what it's gonna take. And by the way, this is not just for security purposes. There's no question that at some time your computer is going to fail. It's not a question of whether, it's a question of when your drive is going to crash. Now, it may be once every 20 years, but it will fail. Um, so go ahead and give yourself some peace of mind, back that computer up, and do it to an external drive. Because, of course, if the bad guys, if it's something that's attached to your computer and the bad guys get in there, they're just going to encrypt your backup as well. So disconnect that external drive from your computer so that the bad guys do not have access to it. You need to have software that does back up the whole computer. Uh, there are a lot of good ones, um, a lot of indifferent ones, but I use one that's called Veeam, V-E-E-A-M, and it does back up the entire computer um, so that you can recover from bare metal. 
You can do an incremental backup, a full system backup. You can recover individual files. You can recover uh, the whole system or a directory. But uh, you need a system like a backup system like that that's flexible. Uh, you can go to vm.com and look for the Windows version of it if you have a Windows system. It's free. Yeah, just probably Google uh, VM free backup and it'll take you there. So let's take a pause and uh, see if we've uh, got some more questions. And I'm going to stop sharing the screen for just a moment. And Kevin, have you got some questions? Yeah, so I have a few questions on this chapter as well as uh, another one relating to phishing. I'll ask the phishing one towards the end. Um, sure. You'd already addressed this, but just to, just to confirm it, we had someone asking, should I wait at least one week to install patches to software when they're released? Uh, 10 years ago, I would have said yes. Um, but the, the quality of the patches today is better and the intensity of the attacks is far higher. So I would say patch that software as soon as you get it. Okay, great. Uh, the next question that I have is regarding software updates. When I'm prompted to update the software on my computer, how do I know that it's a legitimate update request and not a virus? Yeah, um, if, if it's a virus, on your computer, it's already game over. The bad guys are already in there. So you should go ahead and patch your software when you get the prompt saying that there's an update. The one exception to that that I mentioned was Adobe Flash. And occasionally there's drive-by web, uh, websites that will try to get you to download their bogus version of Adobe Flash. But the better way is to just get rid of Flash entirely. Actually, on the subject of Flash, one of the other questions we received is, uh, I've been getting Adobe Flash uninstalled prompts and have ignored them. Is this legit? Uninstall prompt. Uh, doesn't sound legit to me, but I, I, I can't tell without the context. If it's just coming off a website, uh, I'd say, no, it's not legit. Um, if, on the other hand, it's coming from Adobe Flash, uh, it is at its end of life, and it may be just saying, okay, it's time for me to go away. So I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have a a good answer, does, maybe somebody else does. Uh, if, you, if you have any doubt, that ignore the prompt. Go to the Adobe Flash um, part of your control panel or go to the uninstall dialog in your computer uh, and then just uninstall it from there. Uh, but generally speaking, if you get a, a prompt that you don't understand, you shouldn't try to follow that. Yeah, I have another person in the chat also saying that they're apparently getting pop-ups about uninstalling it. So it, maybe it is something that Adobe's doing, but it, it, even so, as you say, better to close the prompt down, go into your control panel and do a manual uninstall just in case. Yep, that's a good rule of thumb. Um, we have someone asking for uh, a definition of uh, ransomware. How would you define ransomware? Hmm. Good question. I'm sorry I didn't uh, make that one clear. Uh, ransomware is where the bad guys get into your computer. They lock up all your files by encrypting them. And then they say, okay, now you can have them back by paying us money. They're ransoming your files. Um, that's morphed into yet another variation, which is uh, ransomware that says, pay me or I will release information that you have. Um, 
for example, a university might have ransomware telling them, hey, pay us money or we'll release all your student records out onto the internet. Uh, or the fake one that I mentioned earlier, uh, we've been observing you watching porn and if you don't pay us money, we're going to tell the world that you watch porn and we've turned on a video camera and we've watched what you're doing. Well, that's all fake, but it's another flavor of ransomware. You know, a brief story on that. Um, a prior workplace, we had someone who received one of those emails, meant to send it to our IT department, and accidentally just sent it to the entire division. So it went out to about 14 people. <laughs> so, Ooh, burn. If you get that at work, just make sure you're sending it to your IT security office and not to everybody. <laughs> Um, I do have a small question. Uh, someone wants just the, you to spell out the backup program that you're mentioning. Um, or if, if anyone else in the chat can provide the link, it was, uh, I believe you said it was VMware or what was the name of it? I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Okay. Um, the final have ties to um, your section phishing and uh, it asks, if I'm sent a strange email like the one that you provided, wouldn't it be better for me to reach out to Facebook or the alleged sender directly to inquire about it rather than click on any links within the phishing email? Absolutely, yes. If, uh, if, you, if you're unsure, like in, in this case, I could see that there were several clues that told me, don't touch this one. But if you've gone through the clues, you still can't tell. Don't click those links, just like you said, but call up or contact the, the supposed source and find out whether they did send it. Yes, excellent point. And um, last question that we have at the moment is, I have a friend that was held hostage and the friend gave them the, uh, the hacker money to get his computer back. Now, what does he do? Well, uh, I guess I'm not sure what what the question is. I mean, if he got it back, uh, he's he's probably got malware inside his computer. Uh, he should get rid of that malware. He may have to just um, reinstall from his backup. Uh, that would be the ideal thing is to roll back before the malware got installed. It's pretty tough to find and remove the malware that's in there. Will you ever be able to trust that computer again? Um, it's a tough one once, once it's been uh, invaded and restored like that. Um, I have an answer for I, that, I think. Uh, if it's a uh, hard drive with the platters and so forth, you remove it from the computer, you get a 16 penny nail and you drive it right through the desk. <laughs> so that, that speaks to the, uh, what Alan was talking about before as far as having backups. Uh, I know with uh, Windows OS and some others, if it affects your master boot record, uh, you may have a very difficult time unless you can uh, have a separate computer and analyze it, but that really requires some special skill. So if you don't know what to do, get rid of it, go to, go to your backups. Yeah, I don't think I'd ever trust that computer as it is again. No, I've heard some horror stories even with professionals trying to fix a computer that had been taking control of like that, but um, the long stories. So um, Alan, I do have one additional question. Do you wanna get into that now or would you like to save it till after the remainder of your presentation? Sure, let's go for it. Okay. Uh, someone's asking, um, I use uh, Apple equipment. Do I need to install antivirus software? And if so, do you have a recommendation? Yeah. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Apple's a bit more conscientious. I mean, they have more of a closed ecosystem. Uh, so there's slightly lower risk. Um, I'm not really a fan of antivirus software. Uh, I think you're better off to just understand what's going on, be conscientious and uh, practice uh, you know, good, uh, good practices. 
Um, I, I would not advocate putting uh, an antivirus program on. Speaking of which, if you do have a Windows computer with antivirus, make sure you've only got one. Um, this is not a situation where more is better uh, because one antivirus program is sufficient. Uh, if you have more than one, each one will think that the other is a virus because they have their hooks pretty deep down into the system. Um, nowadays, uh, the an antivirus program, except for Microsoft's, is an application that runs on top of the operating system, just like every other application. The difference is that for an antivirus program, they have to put their hooks deep down into the operating system. And they're using undocumented interfaces to do that. They, because they don't actually have uh, published interfaces to, to get down in there, sometimes antiviruses, the, the antivirus program itself is a doorway to uh, vulnerability. So that's why I'm not a real fan. And I'm, uh, if, you, uh, if you do use an antivirus program, I would just use the one that comes with Microsoft's uh, Windows, because they are actually do, uh, they're using their, it's a part of the operating system, and they're not having to use undocumented hooks to get down in there. Uh, um, not too long ago, uh, there was a change to the Windows operating system, and it worked fine for almost everybody except for the people who were using a certain antivirus program and their computers went off the rails. And it's because they were using these undocumented interfaces to make the, uh, to access the operating system. So um, I would just use the one that comes with Windows and uh, not worry about it. it it's very effective. It, there was a time, say a decade ago, where the other ones like Norton were, uh, were substantially better at, uh, catching, finding viruses, um, but in modern times, they've really pretty much equaled out. Uh, another factor is that some, like Avast, have been found to be uh, storing your personal information uh, without your knowledge. These are hoovering up information from people's computers. So that's another risk that you really don't want to have to deal with. Any other questions, Kevin? Now, we do have a few follow-ups. So one sure. person is asking why you don't advocate an antivirus software. And I feel like you've, you've kind of addressed that through the discussion you have. But is, is there any other reasons why you don't necessarily recommend an antivirus? Well, I think on a Windows computer, you should have one. Mm -hmm. Uh, just go ahead and use the one that comes with uh, with Windows and kind of forget about it. Uh, once in a while, it'll prompt you with something that uh, looks suspicious, uh, and and that's a good thing. But just being aware of phishing, keeping your software updated is probably even even better. But yeah, I wouldn't advocate running without an antivirus if you're on a Windows computer. But just go ahead and install a Windows one and forget about it. We had another question asking specifically about the quality of uh, the built-in Windows antivirus and whether Windows security, quote unquote, it counts as an antivirus program. And you would say that it does? Yeah, um, it, it's, it used to be not as good as some of the third-party ones. But I'd say that in this year, uh, 2020, it, it is as good. Uh, you'll see reviews and the literature that says this one's going to be slightly better, but it's, it's, a, uh, it's a game of leapfrog and each one improves over time. Um, right. I think it's, it's useful, but don't, it's useful, but don't rely on it. Don't think of it as your primary uh, defense. Uh, just set it and forget it and move ahead. 
Uh, we have a couple comments coming in about uh, VPN clients. And these are things that have been getting a lot of advertisement over the past year or two. Uh, do you feel that uh, VPN clients are necessary? What do you think of VPNs? Yeah, VPNs are, uh, are useful. Um, I actually, uh, I have my own VPN server uh, running on a Raspberry Pi. Um, but most people aren't that much uh, into gearhead stuff. So a VPN is useful. Um, what it does is to create an encryption tunnel between you and the, the, the place that you're on the internet. Um, VPNs are good when you're in the situation of a coffee shop or a hotel where you are using shared Wi-Fi. So it's that scenario where uh, somebody else uh, could in intercept your data stream because they're on the same Wi-Fi network. Um, that's when a, a VPN is useful. Um, I think we have a, an acronym alert here. Yes, yes. Oh, acronym alert. Yes, VPN, sorry. <laughs> it's a virtual private network. Thank you, Angus O. Uh, it's a virtual private network that makes it appear that you and the destination are on a private network together because it creates an encrypted tunnel between you and the destination. Now, I will, I will say that 10 years ago, those things were really important because there were a lot of exploits being done and because the software uh, wasn't as uh, robust as it is today. For example, today, almost all the connections that you do over the internet with the web are HTTPS rather than HTTP. And the S in HTTPS doesn't mean secure, well, it, it might mean secure to some people, but it really doesn't mean you're secure. All it means is that that data is encrypted. And that was one of the problems with the shared Wi-Fi is the unencrypted stuff. Once it's encrypted already, having another encryption tunnel that the encrypted data goes through isn't as critical. So yeah, I'd say that uh, it's a very good thing, particularly if you do a lot of travel where you're spending hotel time or coffee shop time. But I would, uh, I'd say it's less of a problem today than it used to be. And, um, I, but I would still, I would still subscribe to a VPN service and use it in coffee shops and hotels if that's what you're, um, if, if you need to be in those environments. Other questions, Kevin? We have another one coming in, but this is getting into an unrelated topic. So maybe we can finish your presentation and then um, we can ask other just general security questions if that's all right with you. Sounds good to me, okay. Let's get the screen back. Okay, cool. Lastly, we're going to talk about everybody's favorite thing, passwords, the thing we love to hate. Uh, as you heard earlier, I worked at IBM, and when I first uh, signed on there, we were required to change our passwords every 30 days because that was going to improve our security. Well, why could that be a bad idea? Research 
in modern times has shown that it is a bad idea. Because if you have to change your password every 30 days, you have you start out with password one and, and all of a sudden you get this prompt that says, I got to change my password. Now, oh, what, what password am I going to use? Well, I'll, I'll just use password two. And each time you use some variation on that password, it gets weaker and weaker and weaker. And then years down the road, a, or, or, or days, whatever, uh, some bad guy uh, steals all the passwords from yahoo.com, let's say, which happened multiple times. And so they had a password that you had at one time. They had password three. They got that one and they've associated it with your account. It does not take a lot of imagination to go, hmm, let's look for password one, two, and four, and see if we can find the current password for that account. And they try a few combinations. Sure enough, they find that password six works and they're into your account. So the research has shown that you should not change your password frequently. Um, instead, you should have a strong, unique password. Now, as was mentioned earlier, uh, I, I do uh, tax prep with uh, for seniors with uh, tax aid, and I was in a class earlier this year when the subject of passwords came up in the class, and I was rather astonished to hear one of my classmates classmates say, "My password is so strong." I remember it and I just use it every place. So what do you think? Is that, uh, is that a good idea? Uh, clearly not. Uh, two things wrong with it. One is if it's memorable, it's probably not strong enough. And the second thing is don't use it everywhere. Um, because if you use the same password, no matter how strong, on your email account and on your bank account. If your email account is compromised, your bank account is compromised. So bad idea to use a password in multiple places. You want to have a unique password for each place. What about strong passwords? Clearly you want to have strong passwords. Well, the bad guys have dictionaries and those dictionaries have words and letters and combinations and numbers and things in them. And they're not like paper dictionaries that we're accustomed to. These are really programs that try all sorts of combinations. So let's look at a few passwords. So probably the worst password you could have is the word password. But weirdly, people do still use this as an actual password. Um, dumb idea, but the, 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 the thought process might be, okay, I won't use the word password, but I'll substitute in some leap characters. I'll substitute in and make it P4$W0RD, and that'll keep me safe because that's not password anymore. Well, I don't mean to push the bubble, but uh, that those kind of substitutions are already in the bad guy's dictionary. It's very obvious to substitute a dollar sign for an S or a zero for an O. So don't even think about substituting in leap stuff for passwords. It's just, it's not, it's not even useful. Now, clearly that next one being with a Q is a much better password. That's a, uh, that one would be harder to crack. 
And I'd say that that's a, that's a good password right there. Um, but of course, now that one is a real pain in the keister to type it in because you've got the caps and the uppercase up, uh, exclamation point in there. And you're mix, mixing back and forth and it's error prone as you're typing it in. Um, even though it's a good password, it's, uh, it's difficult to type. And so that's the reason for the next one there with correct horse battery staple. These are four random words. Um, I encourage you not to use these particular four because they, they were published in an XKCD cartoon years ago and uh, it's all over the internet. But the idea that he was getting across is to use a passphrase of random words. And because it's, it's very long, it's got good entropy, um, it's almost impossible for the bad guys to, to figure that out uh, and hack into it. Of course, depending upon the, the website you go to, they may have extra rules that say you have to insert uppercase or a number or punctuation or something like that. So you'll probably have to adapt it uh, to, to suit the particular website. But um, it's pretty easy to type in anyway. You can type in correct horse battery staple a lot easier than you can type in that one above it. But of course, you need one of these for every website because I said, you know, you really want them to be unique. Uh, so we'll, and I really, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I advocate password managers to, to do that. And that's the best place to store your passwords. But something about where to store your passwords is, to whom are your passwords at risk? Are they at risk to people that are in your home? Probably not so much. Um, so maybe, maybe a sheet of paper in your desk drawer is a viable possibility for you. Um, are they at risk to, from bad guys out on the internet if your computer gets compromised? Well, that's a reason to not store them as a file in your computer. Because if somebody gets into your computer, they not only have access to your computer, they now have access to all your passwords. So don't store your passwords in a file on your computer, maybe in your desk drawer. But even better is a password manager. And someone earlier was asking whether I advocate those, and I, yes, I do. Um, and these enable you to have really strong passwords. You know, it could be up to whatever length the website will accept, three characters long. It could be random gibberish. Doesn't have to be anything memorable. The, the password manager will type it in for you as well as store it safely. So password managers are a really useful thing. Uh, I use LastPass, um, I've tried a few and I like that one, but uh, I don't, I, I'm not, uh, I'm agnostic about those because any password manager you use is gonna be better than no password at all. Uh, sorry, no password manager at all. Um, it depends on features that you want to uh, for your own environment. It depends on your circumstances. For instance, you may need the ability to synchronize those passwords between your phone and your computer so that if you need to look up some website on your phone that you normally look up on your computer, it's accessible to you. And so that's, that's something that you might consider in a password manager is what features that it needs. 
A second password helper that's really important is two-factor authentication. And these are something that you have, something you know, or something you are. For example, the ATM card that you have is something that you have, and then it prompts you for a PIN, which is something that you know. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that these things can be implemented. For example, on our phones, um, we have uh, a lot of phones have a fingerprint reader. That's something that you are. Or face recognition. Again, that's something that you are. And you add that in with a password and you have two-factor authentication. So I would encourage you to use two-factor authentication. Oh, the one that I didn't mention there on the foil. Uh, Time-based one-time PIN. Uh, this isn't widely used, but it's probably the best one. Um, a lot of you're probably familiar with where you get uh, a text message sent to you uh, to supplement your password. Um, similarly, you can use a time-based uh, one-time PIN, which is a software uh, program that generates a random six-digit number, and you type that in along with your password. Uh, that's a real secure method, better than even uh, the text message or uh, some other ones. So one reason that I, I think this is such a good idea is that Microsoft, uh, which Microsoft stores a lot of passwords for people. They, they have a lot of uh, reports of compromises. Uh, and according to Microsoft, 99.9% of all compromised accounts did not use two-factor authentication. In other words, two-factor authentication blocked 99.9% .9 of password hacks. So think about that for a minute. If you could prevent 99.9% .9 of password hacks, that's pretty, that puts the odds clearly in your corner. So I'd say anytime you have an account that is, has any value to you, uh, extreme examples being your bank account or your Vanguard account, uh, use two-factor authentication. If it has no value whatever to you, um, then okay, maybe you don't need it. It's a bit of a pain to use. Uh, it's just an extra step, but it really does provide valuable uh, security to you. So we're back to the end where we back to the beginning. Um, we talked about the three general attack methods, uh, starting out with recognizing phishing, and we've reviewed that a little bit. Uh, so now you know how to recognize a phishing email. Um, next, I will encourage you to go forth and update your software, uh, check those devices that you have around the house, like your router that maybe haven't been updated. Do uh, follow up when you get the prompts to update software. Get yourself a password manager. Use those strong, unique passwords out there uh, and stay safe. Don't be the low-hanging fruit. Thanks.